You are always welcome to holler out a call for prayer or a song you want to hear sung. And probably if you threw out most verses of scripture, I could I could preach a sermon on it. So just uh, if the Lord moves you, you can do that. I have a new Oh great. Let's hear it. Did I understand you say Boston? Yes. To Boston. Okay. They're hoping they can give them some answers. They think they can. That's much better. They're hoping about Jesus. Taking them down there anyway. So just pray when they get the answers. Nothing grows any, you know, any bigger. And they stop. Even the spring. You know, God can heal. God can help them. But God can do the healing. Right for Jason Burton. No I think they're going to get all the patients physical therapy in there. <laughs> if you, uh, I, the way I understood it, that uh, this, whatever this infection is, it responds to steroids, but the steroids have a devastating effect on Jason. It causes him to, uh, it, he this is the reason he has seizures, I think, isn't it? The steroids cause mm -hmm. that. So let's have a look. Has he had those cancer cancer? Someone has so much radiation, it could possibly cause from that, and that it's decreased the immune system. He's picked up something because of you, his system was down. That is, uh, that often happens. <clears throat> well, let's pray that they, that they can still overcome that. Obviously. <coughs> Maybe Boston, they were contacted, or that's a place, there's a place there that has a really good team on figuring out these kinds of mysteries. Keep us informed. I, I will. I appreciate that very much, and we're just praying for them. Uh, Danny led us in singing tonight, Jesus is all the world to me. I, when I was a pastor at the Woolly Springs Baptist Church, we had a, a precious couple, Chichi and, Hel and Thelma Higgins. Chichi and Thelma Higgins. <laughs> And uh, they were our Methodists. Uh, many years ago, even before I came, they consolidated all the Methodist churches. Actually, they just told everybody that there was a Methodist church right there on the corner where our church was, Woolly Springs, for, for many years. And they were both half-time churches. So uh, for one Sunday, they'd go to the Baptist church. And the next Sunday, they'd go to the Methodist church. And they, churches did that all over the country. They couldn't afford to... Uh, have a full-time preacher at both places, so they and they went to each other's revivals and things like that, and they so they just closed uh, closed down. They, the Methodists were going through some difficult times. I don't I don't know what their state is now, but they didn't have enough ministers. Uh, our, most of the Methodist ministers that I've had fellowship with over the years, pastor two or three churches, they're still kind of doing that out in the rural area. Right. So they were all instructed just to wherever they'd been going to church, just to go to to Ardmore to the Methodist church there. And Chichi and Thelma were on their way to tell me this, told me this story, that they were on their way to Ardmore, to the big city church there, and they looked at each other and said, you know, we, we don't know anybody there except just the people we meet in town. And all of our friends out here at Bethel, and, uh, you know, that's where we go. To, we, we still have a church there, the Baptists. So they turned around right on that Sunday and went back to Woolly Springs, and they never joined the church, but they were very faithful members. As a matter of fact, there was a group of ladies, four, three or four ladies, who sang there, and when they started singing, they would sing special music. They were Chi-Chi's Chicks. But all, after the years kind of passed by, they became Higgins Hens. And uh, I remember this story. That's the reason I, uh, they, they were, the Baptists were having a revival, and it was almost two week long, and they not only had day evening service, but they had day services. And they were everybody in the community. Everybody in the community would come to both services. I mean, everybody. And uh, but one day, the uh, everybody around there grew cotton. 
But they, the word had gotten out, you know, a text or a Facebook announcement. Some, who knows, word had gotten out that the cotton gin had received everybody's check. Checks had come in. And it was going to be like at 10 o'clock. Come by and pick up your check at the cotton gin. Uh, you know, their check. That is their, their livelihood. What they were going to feed their family with. That, uh, and so they all went down there and lined up. There's a line to get their check. And they weren't at church that morning. But they all came that night. And just before the message, just before the preaching, they sang, Jesus is all the world to me. That, that evangelist got up there and he ripped the hide right off of all those farmers. He said, yeah, Jesus is all the world to you. Did I tell you what's all the world to you? Them checks down there at the, at the oh. cotton gin today. <laughs> Chinchy thought that was so funny. And, uh, you know, preachers will do things like that. What's, what's wrong with those guys? But, I, I, you know, I, they were just probably all, you know, what, what are they going, what could they do? And uh, he didn't, that preacher didn't think that through. I don't think that was ordained by the Spirit. But Jesus is all the world to me. Well, he is. And, but he's blessed us with checks, too, to feed our family with. My goodness, that comes from him as well. We don't have to choose that over him or him over that. Thank him for that. Preacher, I, I love the Lord and love church, but the blessings of the Lord are waiting for me down there at the cotton gin. I remember when I was a little boy, my uncle Buddy taking me to the cotton gin. To, uh, I don't even remember what we were there to do, but it was the one at Pisgah. And he introduced me to a little bottle of Coca-Cola with peanuts and poured in the top of the neck. <laughs> I didn't know what that was. And he showed me. I've never forgot it. Hadn't had that in a long time. That salty and sweet. Well, those little Coca-Cola bottles, little Coca-Cola, they were so sweet you could just pour it over pancakes. Yeah. And it was so good. Put those, you had to take a swig or two of Coke and then pour them peanuts up in the top of about half of them. <coughs> it's probably the whole shooting match cost about 12 or 15 cents. Yeah. Let me give you two pieces of trivia tonight that uh, I didn't uh, put in the sermon this morning, but they were part of the preparation, so that, that happens sometimes. You probably think, well, he probably always puts everything he's got in there. You know? Seems that way, doesn't it? I learned uh, recently, we're talking about how Paul, even, even Paul and Silas were allowing the adulteration of the gospel <coughs> and adding rules and regulations and stuff that the church was voting on. Let's just add that to the gospel. I learned this week that if you, if you eat an apple, tell us, you just go anywhere in the world and you get an apple and you eat it and you, you open up the core of the apple after you finished eating the apple and you take the seeds out. They say that the apple is a particular uh, produce product in our world today but it's not true to seed. It's not true to seed. Uh, this article claimed that the, the apple has been genetically manipulated more than any other food in human history. And we haven't been doing that, you know, forever and ever and ever. But they found out that the apple, well, you can just take, you can have like three or four different kinds of apples growing on the same tree. And they have uh, genetically modified seeds. So if you take a seed, oh, you got a Jonathan apple, for instance. And you take a seed out of there and plant it in your backyard or start a seedling, whatever, get it going. That there's, you, you may or may not get a Jonathan apple because it's not true to seed. You know, you take a green apple and you might plant it in the ground and red apples come up because all the seeds that are available in the world today have been genetically modified to produce a sweeter apple, an apple. Most of the time, do you know why they modify foods genetically? Not so they'll taste better, so they'll last longer, you know, from, yeah, from the field. They want to have preservatives and stuff. Yeah, and they want, it, they want it to be able to be pretty when you, uh, when you pick it out at the grocery from the produce department. So it's one of the most amazing things that the gospel story is so completely unchanged over 2,000 years. As much as we have fiddled with it and... and uh, muddled around with it. There, there is a word that, that I learned when I was in college <coughs> that is relative to the book of Acts, specifically. 
And it's the word kerygma. Kerygma. And that word means the seed, if you would, or the heart. The, the core. The gospel was about Jesus dying on the cross and his resurrection and his having been seen by eyewitnesses. So, it, it is really amazing. So, there's so many different denominational Christian beliefs, but after 2,000 years of people like me and you and us, Christian people, feeling like that there was just a little bit of something missing, uh, adding this and taking away that, still we can look into the scriptures and we can see the true story of Jesus. Something else. Mentioned this morning in the, the singing of Near My God to Thee, I was talking with Randy about that. He and I enjoy trivial pursuit, and so we pursue it often. But uh, do you know that the whole story of the sinking of the Titanic has had to be uh, rewritten? It, it's, it has had to be rewritten and a uh, new understanding. Because what has been discovered from the wreck itself, and also when they had the hearings, they had hearings here in America, and they had hearings over in London after the sinking of the Titanic to discover what happened and why all those 1,500 people drowned. A lot of different reasons. But they discovered, they found something within the, that was actually in testimony that was just kind of brushed aside by those who were leading the investigation and ignored. But it was confirmed, found by people in very recent months and confirmed by further examination of the photos and everything, the data from having discovered where the wreck is at. When the Titanic left the UK, there was a, a coal fire in their coal bunker. The coal, they shoveled coal into the engines, which were steam engines. They shoveled coal, but sometimes what happens when you get combustible materials, you can even have a big barn full of hay or a, a, a silo full of soybeans. And just simply those gases that are naturally released will create a combustion, a fire. And so when they left the UK on its maiden voyage, the coal in the bunker was on fire. It was on fire. And they, they couldn't put the fire out. Couldn't put the fire out. And so they had an idea. Uh, you know, it's cold and it's already on fire, so those men, to the danger and detriment of their lives, shoved burning coal into the, into the, boil, into the engines, the burners. Just, you know, as close, until they had eventually shoveled all of it out. But one thing, two things it did. The first thing was that it raised the temperature of the outer hull of the ship to up to 1,800 degrees, and it was that way for three days. If you know anything at all about metallurgy, when you heat uh, metal up like that, if you don't heat it in the proper way, it becomes brittle, and, and it becomes, it loses its temper. It's no longer tempered steel, it is flaky and uh, weak. Another thing is, it was always a mystery as to why was the Titanic going so fast? Well, it, it was uh, presented that it was their maiden voyage and they wanted to impress people with their speed and they wanted to break some records or set a new record. The Titanic was a luxury liner. On its best day, going wide open, it could never, ever, ever impress anybody with its speed. It wasn't built for speed. It couldn't go fast. It didn't matter how hard you kicked it. It couldn't go fast. And they thought, well, that's not why they were going fast. They were going as fast as they could. Why were they going as fast as they could? Well, so why? They were shoveling hot coal into the engines just as fast as they could. And so they weren't trying to beat a time or set a record or get there early. They were trying to get rid of a problem. And that, all of that working together, uh, actually. And so when that ship hit that iceberg, it should have been able to hit 100 icebergs and never even scratch the paint. But when that 
that whole quarter panel of that ship had become so brittle because of the extreme heat of the fire. When it hit that iceberg, that thing just crumpled and crushed and split from seam to seam, and it let water in that never should have been able to get in at all. Well, I'll end back to a little bit of trivia with this. I understand that next year, an exact perfect replica of the Titanic is going to launch. So if you want to get your tickets, you need to sign up now. <laughs> Don't know if I'd go for that. I might go for a tour to go see it, but when they get ready to launch off, it's the unsink unsinkable ship. Well, let's look at uh, James chapter 1. Let's go to, I think verse 22 is doers of the word and not hearers only. Andy. Back uh, when the movie Titanic was released, I had never studied it much, and that, that was an amazing movie. To I, I, I was fascinated with it because they had discovered, they had only recently discovered the wreck, and I began to look at all the different pieces and parts of that. There are many, many, many stories linked to that event, and uh, I saw on a church sign one time it says uh, that when that your boat will never sink if Jesus is in it. Well, that's just not true. As a matter of fact, we had, there were two people when I first became pastor of the Oak Park Baptist Church. They were fishing down here by the dam. Two of the uh, finest Christian men that had ever been members there at, at Oak Park, and they drowned there uh, because when the, when the turbines turned on, they were a little bit too close, and they drowned right there. Uh, there were many fine Christian people also on the Titanic. Sometimes when Jesus is in the boat with you, your ship might still sink. He didn't promise that we wouldn't be. Nothing bad would ever happen to us. Well, James is that person who believed that what other people think of us is important. And I didn't mean to downplay the importance of that this morning. It is not the, of the ultimate importance. But he says, when people look at you, they ought to see a Christian. Be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For any, if anybody's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at himself in the mirror. He, he looks at himself and then he walks away and forgot what he looked like. Whoever looks at the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Jesus had a, a wonderful parable. He said, the kingdom of God, he says, a man is like a man who he says, a man who hears my word and, and does it is like this. Do you remember which story he told then? He said, the person who hears my word and does it is like a man who built his house on a rock. Yeah. The wise man and the foolish man. That's right. Uh, even before I knew much about the Lord, I remember Miss Swanwood told us about it. Uh, wise man built his house upon the rock, and the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down, the floods came up. The house on the rock stood firm. And the foolish man built his house on the sand. Jesus told that two-part uh, story. And he said, but the man who hears my word and doesn't do what I say, he said, like a man who builds his house on the sand. Now, here, that's what James is saying. You know, James may not have ever heard that story, but he's got the idea here. He says, You're, if you hear it, he says you look at the perfect law of liberty and continue therein. In other words, not only hear it, but do it. You're going to be blessed in your deed. If any among you be religious and brought up not his tongue, he deceives his own heart. So just as an example, he said, this is the kind of thing we do. Just yeah, 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 yeah. This man's religion is vain. Pure religion under the Father before God is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. He said, you know, that's, that's what real religion is. Let's look over to chapter 2, verse 1. My brothers, have not the faith <coughs> of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Uh, remember that this is a brother who grew up with him, the Lord of glory, he called him. Didn't believe in him until after the resurrection. James was an unbeliever. He's, 
He scoffed at Jesus. He did not believe Jesus. The Lord of glory. Lord of glory. Have, have you ever, you know, you, you live a, a, a Christian life, you let the Lord work in and through you the best you know how, and yet still there may be those who, are, who refuse to see the glory of God in you and, and would not testify to your goodness. Perhaps, but God has promised to bring forth our righteousness as the, as the new day sun. He says, don't be a respecter of persons. In other words, a respecter of, of persons is someone that this person is someone that I respect and I, I like this person or I, uh, th this person is someone that, that I'm drawn to but these people over here I don't really have much use for them. He said, don't be like that. Don't be like that. Do you have a list that you, of people you like and don't like or people that you prefer? Uh, it's a natural tendency for us to do that. But listen, we've got to be the kind of person who d looks at God, uh, people the way God does. <coughs> For if there come to your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. I wonder how much, you know, maybe he had to hear the stories of Jesus from Jesus' disciples. Jesus told a story. He says, when you get invited to a party, don't go and sit in the chief seats. Don't go find the best place in the house. Don't go sit at the head of the table. He says, go over here and sit in the corner. He says, you know, you might go over there and sit in the big place. He said, it's going to be real embarrassing if the host has to come over to you and says, uh, excuse me, uh, you're sitting in somebody important place. <laughs> you're going to have to leave. <laughs> Jesus said, ooh, wouldn't that be funny? Wouldn't that be awful? He says, you know, you're sitting over there in the corner, and then in front of everybody, Jesus said, somebody come over to you and says, sir, uh, boy, you, you're a, we think a whole lot of you. We wish you'd come over here and sit at the head of the table. Jesus said, let's think of it. Everybody see you get up, and the host leads you to the place of honor. Jesus said, do it that way. And he says, I, he didn't say this, but I, what I think he means, well, you might go to a party or a feast or a festival, and you sit down. Probably not about, nobody's going to say anything at all. But, you know, I'm, Jesus said, I'm making a point out of the extremes. Now, He's talking about a problem in the church. A man with a gold ring comes in. A man, he says, in vile raiment. Vile raiment. I think it's some of the clothes Terry won't let me wear. <laughs> I come home the next weekend, they're gone. I can't even find them. My favorite, my favorite pair of underwear. Real comfortable. I had them all stretched just right. They're gone. I can't find them. I don't know. I noticed, you know, I, this is awful. It's awful. I come in every week and I bring my wash. Can you imagine that? A grown man and can't even do his own wash. And I come in and bring it to my wife. She's a good wife. She's a good person. And when, before I leave on Sunday night, she's got a big basket there. She's got all my, all my clean stuff in a, in a basket there. But I did notice that there's all my washcloths and my T-shirts and underwear and, and towels and things and one sock laid there for one sock. And I know that that other sock, I know exactly where it's at. It's with my favorite pair of underwear up in the underwear head. <laughs> That's where it's at. I, I, I've got it all figured out. Uh, vile raiment. Now this is, a, here's a problem in the church that the people with the gold rings and the fancy clothes and the people with the vile raiments, they, they're, they're having a difficulty, they're, they're showing, showing disrespect for the poor and showing fa uh, favoritism or they're showing that they are respected persons to the rich. This has never ever been a problem 
before in the social gatherings of human beings. Think about this. What is happening here? Why in the world, listen to this, why in the world are rich people and poor people together at anything? Why? Well, they, they didn't ever run in the same crowd before. They didn't fellowship or associate. They have poor people. You now, Danny and I were talking, he, he said he visited Haiti when I think when he was an 18-year-old. What did you see in Haiti there as far as people? Rich and poor. Rich and poor, they have big old mansions with big walls, and the people outside will build their old shanty huts and lean them up against that big wall because it was a, a good wall. Saw that in my travels. Who are people? Just destitute, and then rich people. They didn't ever have cookouts, and they didn't get invited to each other's weddings. They didn't ever uh, get together and laugh and sing together. This is a problem in the church because they met Jesus. Rich people met Jesus and they needed him. Poor people met Jesus. They'd heard about him and they needed him. And they're in church together. Paul talks about men and women. Men and women. And you and I think, of, here's men and women. we got men and women. In 1974, when I went to India, I was invited with a couple of my friends to go over there and do some preaching and singing. And we went into the Christian college that had invited us there, and they had chapel every, every evening. And the women sat on one side, I know it was the left, and the men would sit on the right. Even among Christians, the men and the women... Do you know you can go into Arab countries right now and men and women don't walk together. They don't ride together. They, they don't, you don't see Muslim men and women together. And so we see about, you know, like uh, Ananias and Sapphira. Or we see about uh, different couples that Paul mentions as being very eager to do the work of the Lord. That's just completely unheard of in those times and in those parts of the country. Men and women together. There was one country that we spent the most of our time in, and we noticed everywhere we went, we noticed everywhere we went, all the young boys and teenagers and young men, as you saw them out around in town, holding hands. Young men. And uh, arm in arm walking and we saw it everywhere and just so many of course we were raised in the south and you know we we're christian people but but we we didn't want to be rude and we, we were pretty sure that we were missing something there so we we asked one of our ladies said uh, we, we just kind of wonder uh, what is what's up with that and i think they understood our question said oh it's, it said uh, people crave Human touch. They, we, we need to. We need closeness and physical touch. He said these are, for the most part, he says, perfectly ordinary heterosexual males. Uh, and the women do the same thing. You know, I, I always, when we had had dances at the elementary school at Flint, all the girls would dance with each other, and the boys would just stand back and say, "Oh no, 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 no I'm going to do the no square dancing, no." no dancing, but the girls would dance with it. And the girls, they enjoyed one another's company and things like that. That's, they, they, because they have a greater liberty, I think, and the openness of mind. Boys are sometimes, who knows about boys. But uh, bondmen, bondmen, slaves, and their masters went to church together. This is the most inexplainable cultural mystery of all time. And yet it displays. And, and yeah, they were having trouble. They weren't getting along great. That's a good kind of problem to have. James is telling them how to handle it, how to deal with it. He 
saying, that's a problem. He said, y'all, y'all haven't been around the rich folks much. Y'all haven't been around the poor folks much. And uh, now, you kind of get a slant here that James was a poor folk. And so he didn't know what he, he kind of sounds like he's got a little bit of bias against the rich people. And he's telling the story. Are you not then partial in yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you're called? Take verse 8 up to the top there. Thank you. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You do well. <coughs> Pardon me. If you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convicted of, as, of, of the law as transgressors. So he's, he's scolding them a little bit. He says, now, y'all, uh, these are, for the most part, there are a lot more poor people. It's almost always been that way. A lot more poor people. But when people started meeting, not because they had commonality, not because they ran in the same social circles, not because of their wealth. But they, you know, I look around in churches where I've served and the churches that I'm aware of, and I see people who are drawn who are not anything at all alike. It's, it's still a very miraculous thing. We don't like the same things. We don't enjoy, we're, we're not, we don't attend the Walnut Grove Baptist Church because of all of the things that we have in common of the things, the hobbies we enjoy, or the pastimes. We don't enjoy the same kinds of food, or the same kinds of music. We don't enjoy the same kinds of fashion, uh, or different kinds of cologne or perfume. We all have so many kinds of differences. We've raised our children differently. We associate, or we, uh, we fellowship, or we relate to people in different ways. We're the most unlikely bunch of people to have been gathered together. Jesus' disciple band was a mixture of, of, of explosive proportions. Why, just, to, just if, he, if all he'd ever done was call Matthew, the tax collector, to be one of his disciples, that's all he really needed to do to kind of set the fuse for a tinderbox. These people didn't like each other. They didn't belong to each other. They didn't come from the same places. There were a few fishermen, but they were not all fishermen. Some of them were very well educated, and other them probably couldn't even write their names. And so we see here that, and it continues, that sometimes the things that are different about us are the things that we enjoy that is different cause sparks to fly or causes us sometimes to be unhappy. That's why the thing that brought us here has to be the only and important thing, and that's Jesus. You know, one of the most amazing things to me is that black people in America today, many black people love the Lord Jesus. Do you know how they were introduced to our faith? Slave owners took them to church with them and, and introduced them to Jesus. That doesn't mean that there's anything at all good about slavery or that slavery was a good thing that was responsible for the black person today of knowing Jesus. Not at all. It's just that the Lord Jesus is always, has always been able to bring light out of the darkest darkness. Jesus has always been able to bring the greatest good out of the most terrible, awful evil. And that's what slavery is. The darkest darkness. The most terrible evil. I never would say, and say see there, slavery was, did some good things. It never did anything good. Never did anything. Never accomplished anything good at all. Nothing good about owning another human being at all. Not on one thing. And yet... Many of the people who fought for the liberation of slaves in our country were abolitionists and Christian people who knew that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as Paul said, is for the man and the woman, the, it's for the rich and poor, it's for Jew and Gentile, it's for bond, bondmen and 
master. So that it, it puts us all and makes us all equal before the eyes of God and as his children. One final thing that I want you to leave you is, is, is unrelated. It's kind of a change of gears. But he did mention, you know, he, he says, you know, if you're being, if you're showing partiality, he said, you're, you're a, that's a sin. He said, that's a sin. In verse 10, he says, well, whosoever should keep the whole law, and yet in one, offend in one point, he is guilty of all. That is important because someone might say, well, I've only, I do have a hard time getting along with poor people. Or I really, really despise rich people. But that's my only fault. James states something here that all of the rabbis taught and that the Bible itself teaches. If you break one law, you're guilty of all. You just pick one of the Ten Commandments. If you break one of the Ten Commandments, God considers that in all the commandments broken. He explains it here in verse 11. He that says, do not commit adultery, said also, don't kill. Now, if you commit, if you commit no adultery, <coughs> but if you kill, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy, and, have, and mercy rejoices against judgment. And what he's saying is, if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of all. That, and this is one place where, this is the greatest place, where James is different from the old Pharisees. They thought that they were keeping all the law, and maybe they went astray here on this point or that point. But Jesus was trying to teach them, no, you're, you're sinners, you're lost. You need a Savior. It doesn't matter. He says, Jay says in verse 10, if you keep the whole law, you keep all the law, and the feasts, the festivals, the, the sacrifices, the new moons and the Sabbaths, and all the commands throughout the Bible. And he says, and yet you break one of them, you become a transgressor of all. If you're guilty of one, you're guilty of all. He says, when you stand before God in judgment, and they say, how many laws did he break? How many laws did he break? And he's thinking, one? You know what the, what the judge is going to say? Broke them all. Broke them all. Broke them all. You know, when I say that, I think of a symbol. I think of Moses coming down from the top of Mount Sinai with the tablets of the law in his hands. There was one particular one of the laws that they were breaking down there. They were worshiping false gods. The first commandment says, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, him only shalt thou serve. But then Moses just threw the tablets down. When he threw the tablets down, how many of them broke to pieces? All of them. All of them. They all just crumbled to crumbs. And I don't know if that's related. It always relates that way in my mind. That Moses knew, he could come down and say, Well, he could look at the commandments and say, well, they're only breaking one commandment. Let's go with that. Moses knew that if they were just breaking one, they were breaking them all. Because he sits our attitude toward the lawgiver. If we're willing to break one of his laws, we'll break, we'll break any laws. And we'll break all the laws. And we're judged as being a transgressor of the law. It's not that God marks the here and marks there. It's just a transgressor of the law or not. He's a transgressor of the law. That's what James is saying. When he looks into your book, he's not going to see a whole list of all the things you've done right and wrong. He says, transgressor of the law. Transgressor of the law. Maybe you only broke one. He's done. You're a transgressor of the law. That's all that really matters. You've showed disrespect to the lawgiver. All right. Pastor Henry a little bit on Thursday. Give him a call or two. I think he was born about 3 o'clock in the morning, wasn't he? Call him by, <laughs> call him by 3 a.m. and say, hey, Henry, happy birthday. No, no. And he says, no. Happy birthday to you. He did see the videos. Mom played the video off Facebook. All right, good. All right, good. He didn't see it, see Y'all have a good week. And uh, pray for me. I really need to work this week. Last week was a crazy week, and uh, I don't know. I'm going to go home and... Medicaid, thermal aid.
vaporate. And maybe I'll wake up all healed up in the morning. Look for you on the side. I, 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 yeah, it's going to be with Jesus. It's going to be with Jesus. I think she placed that other sock there just as a memorial to the one that was gone. So I'll grieve for a while. And then I'll get a I'll get a hole in one, and then I'll say I can use that that one sock now because I got a hole in one. I got to throw one away. All right. God bless you all. I don't even have a final prayer, me folks. God go with you, and you be careful this week.